There is a uh, Starbucks coffee shop on the corner of 51st Street and Broadway in New York. It is known as the most lucrative Starbucks location for musicians. The tips can be quite generous if the songs are perfect for an evening sipping coffee and listening to music. So it was a chilly Manhattan night in November 2006 when two guys were playing at the coffee shop. One was playing drums, singing the lead, while the other sang backup and played keyboards. The weather outside might have been a little chilly for November, but it was warm and friendly on the inside. And the two knew they were playing all the right notes and all the right songs because the tip basket was almost overflowing. Now playing at Starbucks isn't exactly a tough job if you know how to do it right. A musician must know their audience before they play if you want to be able to accomplish the job which has been set before you. Many years ago, I was hired to play Christmas music at the Kmart in Perrysburg, of all things. My job was to sell a line of Casio keyboards. The keyboards were all piled up around me and I was set right in the center aisle as you're coming down the center aisle as you walk in the store and there I was in the middle of all these keyboards just sitting there with one keyboard just playing. Now it was mostly Christmas music but I discovered something. If somebody came up and requested a song and I played it and luckily I can play by ear pretty well so I would quickly just, okay I can do this. If I played it, they would feel guilty and buy a keyboard because <laughs> I played it for them. So very quickly I realized now I, I just started asking, hey, you want to you have anything you'd like me to play? And I was playing all kinds of stuff, but I began to sell keyboards and every day I was getting selling more and more and the manager was liking me more and more because I had only basically signed up for a week and by the time I was done, I played right through Christmas. Know your audience. It's something I took to heart that day and the duo playing music at the Starbucks was doing the same thing. They sang mostly pop songs from the 40s to the 90s, and when they played the classic song, If You Don't Know Me By Now, there was a lady singing or sitting in one of the lounge chairs nearby. She was swaying to the beat, and she was singing along. And after the song was over, the duo took a break. While the percussionist went outside for a few minutes, the keyboardist remained. The singing lady walked over and she said, I apologize for singing along to that song. Did it, did it bother you? No, the keyboardist replied. We love it when the audience joins in. W would you like to sing up front on the next selection? Well, to his delight, she accepted the invitation. Well, what song do you want to sing? And she said, it, 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 you choose what song you want. What are you in the mood to sing? And she said, well, do you know any hymns? Well, little did the lady know, the keyboardist grew up in church. He said that before he was even born, he was already a regular church attender. He smiled and said, name a hymn. Oh, I don't know, the lady said. There are so many good ones. You pick one. Okay, he replied. How about his eye is on the sparrow? Well, the keyboardist's new friend was silent. Her eyes looked down. Then she fixed her eyes on him again and said, yeah, let's do that one. She put down her purse. She straightened her jacket and faced the center of the shop. With a two-bar setup, she began to sing. Why should I be discouraged? Why should the shadows come? The audience of coffee drinkers suddenly went silent. Everyone was transfixed on this lady singing. Even the gurgling noises of the cappuccino machine were silenced as the employees turned to listen. The song rose to its conclusion. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. When the last note was sung, the applause crescendoed to a deafening roar that would have rivaled a sold-out Carnegie Hall. Embarrassed, the woman tried to shout over the din, Oh, y'all go back to your coffee. I didn't come here to do a concert. I just came in here to get something to drink, just like you. But the ovation continued. The employees, everyone was on their feet, cheering. The keyboardist stood up and embraced his new friend. You, my dear, have made my whole year. That was beautiful. Well, it's funny you picked that particular hymn, she said. Why is that? Well, and she stopped for a second. She said, that was my daughter's favorite song. Really, he excitedly proclaimed it. He was so excited. This was the daughter's favorite song. Yes, she said. And then she grabbed his hands. By this time, the applause had subsided, and it was business as usual. With sadness in her eyes, she spoke softly. 
She was 16, and she died of a brain tumor last week. He said the first thing that found its way through the stunned silence. Well, are you, are you going to be okay? She smiled through tear-filled filled eyes and squeezed his hands. I'm going to be okay. I've just got to keep trusting the Lord and singing His songs, and everything's going to be just fine. Trusting the Lord in the midst of the storm. Trusting the Lord when the world turns upside down. Trusting the Lord in those desperate and scary times when it feels like we have nothing to hold on to. Those are the times when we turn to the rock that is our salvation. Her daughter died one week before. One week. And here she's saying in that Starbucks, a song of faith, a song of devotion, a song of belief in God, that no matter what happens, she knows his eye is on the sparrow and he watches over me. The words to the song We Believe talk of those times when everything seems lost. The opening line, in this time of desperation, when all we know is doubt and fear. But immediately the song turns to the place where the lady in Starbucks found her faith. There is only one foundation. We believe, we believe. In this broken generation, when all is dark, you help us see. There is only one salvation. We believe, we believe. And then the song takes a turn to what our belief means. Now the majority of Christians in many de denominations, both Protestant and Catholic, will see the words of the chorus to be one thing. They will see it as a creed. What is a creed and specifically what does it mean to Christianity? Well, in the early days of the church, Christians decided they needed a way to determine if you were a true believer or not. Reciting a creed and accepting it served a purpose, and that purpose was it distinguished the people who believed the same thing you did from those who did not. It especially established what doctrines each believed in. When you accepted a creed, you were identifying yourself with a certain faith group. Well, I grew up in a Southern Baptist church, as I've said before, and a creed was a foreign concept to us. In fact, the first time I ever actually recited a creed out loud in public anywhere was two summers ago during worship services at our Brothers Keeper mission trip. I literally had never said a creed out loud. I read them at seminary and I knew of them, but I had very little contact with creeds of any kind. Very simply, Baptists, as I am, though not Southern Baptist, do not recite the Apostles' Creed or the Nicene Creed or any creed of the larger church. Why? Well, in the case of Baptists, it strikes at the foundation of what Baptists believe. The church leaders of the past laid down a line cast in stone which comes to this. We accept no creeds except the Bible. Nothing else. It is the Bible and the Bible alone. Another way to put this, the final authority for our faith, our doctrine, and the practicing of our faith is not a set of words about the Bible. It is the Bible. Baptists have always been more interested in practicing and living out the words of the Bible than in theological uniformity, that we all have to believe exactly the same thing. Now, in my personal life, the issue comes down to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. In the end, it doesn't matter to me whether you agree with me on the timing of the end times. It doesn't matter to me whether you believe, like some Baptists do, that women can't be ordained or teach men. It doesn't matter to me whether you believe foot washing is an ordinance or not. It doesn't matter to me if you believe the celebration of communion means the grape juice turns into the blood of Jesus or not. The question for me is can we hold our hands together and be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ and tell the world about our faith in God? But that doesn't mean that we don't believe in anything. What is interesting about Baptists is that they may not believe in creeds, but they do believe in what's called a confession of faith. Now, I've had some people in other denominations say, well, wait a second. A confession of faith is nothing more than a creed. You're just calling it something different. Well, here is the difference. Creeds prescribe what one must believe to belong to a particular church. Confessions describe generally the beliefs of a people. A Baptist will tell you that a confession is a declaration of faith made freely without any coercion. You are not forcing me to believe this. It is my confession, but you're not saying in order to be what I am, you have to be like me. And yet, a Baptist will also ask you to step forward and make your faith public. So to me, there is a very fine line between the two, and sometimes it is hard for people to understand. 
So I also take a different stand when it comes to creeds. Throughout the Bible and the Old Testament, we read many prayers and songs that were repeated on a regular basis. We even repeat New Testament words once a month when we celebrate the Lord's Supper together. We do it every time, every single time. So much so that I have them memorized just because I've done it so often. There is purpose and meaning in repetition. It ingrains the words in our hearts. It becomes a living and breathing instrument we can use when we are struggling. Like his eye is on the sparrow and he watches over me. I was reading an article this past week in which they said they didn't like all the praise songs in church because they just repeated the same words over and over again. Well, guess how I learned all the old hymns of the church? I sang them over and over again. Remember when we talked about Days of, Eli Days of Elijah and the line about Jehovah? There is one God, Jehovah. There is one. And you repeat it over and over. You are stating a fact, you are repeating it, and it becomes ingrained in your heart. Now, no, it is not. Now, that is directly from Scripture, but it isn't necessarily Scripture itself, but it is a way to build our faith and grow our faith, knowing that we have something that we can depend on, and we have those songs of God in our heart. There is purpose and meaning and repetition. When we were to stand and, and speak those creeds, the, the creed that we spoke of in, uh, at Brother's Keeper, my first thought was, oh my goodness, this is something that I've never done before. And I did, I, we, we, I talked with the leaders, they said, okay, exactly, where did this come from? And they said, well, we felt it was important that everybody understand what it means to be a Christian, that we're not just here to get together and serve God and nothing else, that there is something more, that we are here to serve God, but we're also showing and saying that we have a faith that is important and we are stating the general beliefs of that faith. Because it wasn't a creed, in fact, the words that we spoke, and Bon, you may remember this, the words that we spoke, I believe in Jesus Christ, are all the words that we sing and we believe. They are the same words, almost exactly. And there was nothing about saying you have to say this in order to become a Christian. They never said that at any time. But they want to state the values and the truths of our faith. A creed is also useful in that it provides an example to express our faith, not as an instrument of force, of coercion, or a requirement of membership, but as a way to explain why we believe what we believe. If we're to go to the Bible and look through the Bible, you'll find very quickly that the elements of our faith are all in different places. It is nice to have it all sort of encapsulated in one place. Now, normally I move through a specific passage. You know this from our, my messages that we look at a specific passage and sort of tear apart that passage as we move through it. And this morning is a little different because instead of going through one passage, we are looking for the elements that make our faith whole and what it means to be who we say we are. And the chorus of We Believe states those very clearly. It begins, We believe in God the Father. Well, the fact is, you can't have God without Jesus, and you can't have Jesus without the Father. In John 14, verses 6 and 7, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, this is important, if you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. It's funny that our culture, and even the Christian culture, places the emphasis on Jesus being the loving part of the Trinity. God is the stern one. He's the angry one. He's the one you don't want to go to if you've gotten in trouble. He's the, he's the one that is the, like the father figure that, you know, that does all the discipline. And Jesus, oh, he's the loving one who cares about everybody. Yet, Scripture tells us that God is love, very clearly. In 1 John 4, 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from who? From God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. God is the one we see constantly forgiving through the Old Testament. He showed us his love first before Jesus was ever born in Bethlehem. So we begin with God the Father. And then the song moves to the next, part, the next words. We believe in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the central figure of the New Testament. And he is the thread that runs all through the Old Testament. 
I believe in the Jesus of the Bible, not just Jesus of the New Testament. I believe in Jesus of the whole Bible, every part of it, Old Testament, New, because everything in the Old Testament has Jesus woven into it. It does take some digging, it does take some work, but Jesus is there. He's there through the whole thing. We begin to see what it means to be forgiven. We begin to see why the offerings in the Old Testament were replaced by Jesus. So in order to have Jesus, you need to know what's going on in the Old Testament. Therefore, the entire Bible to me is all about Jesus. The birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Through who? The Holy Spirit which happens to be the next line in the chorus of We Believe. We believe in the Holy Spirit. You know that uh, football player that nobody talks about? He's usually the offensive lineman who is there on every play. He protects the quarterback. He gives the running back room to run. Nobody knows he's there until he's gone. Suddenly the offense can't move forward. No one knows why. He's the underrated and underappreciated member of the team. And he's only appreciated when he's gone. I think in many ways the Holy Spirit is like that. The Holy Spirit is like the secret agent of the Trinity. Once we've accepted Christ into our lives, it is the Holy Spirit who lives in us. As we draw closer to God, the work of the Holy Spirit grows more obvious, especially when we drift away. It becomes obvious when we step away and suddenly that part of us isn't there anymore. Suddenly we can't make the four moves that we need to make because the Holy Spirit isn't with us. Underrated, undervalued member of the Trinity. It's like the football player who's suddenly gone. There is an obvious difference. In John 14, 16 and 17 it says, And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. There it is again. The underappreciated, undervalued. But you know him, for he lives in you and will be in you. The penalty for fail falling short of the glory of God is one thing, and that is death. But the words of the chorus of we believe continue. We believe he's given us new life. So important. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace you have been saved. The only reason we can believe that a penalty that deserves death can be pardoned is what the chorus goes on to say. We believe in the crucifixion. We believe that he conquered death. We believe in the resurrection, and he's coming back again. We believe. Jesus is my Savior because he made the ultimate sacrifice. He died for each and every one of us. His death is the reason we can have a relationship with God. He is the reason that when we confess our sin, he forgives our sin. And finally, he is coming back again. When I sing, we believe, I am publicly professing my faith in God. I am affirming the truths I believe in as a Christian. And the words that we sing are those same words that we, sang at or that we spoke at Brother's Keeper. To me, it is not a creed. It's a confession. It is a profession of my faith. The woman who lost a child only the week before sang his eyes on the sparrow and he watches over me. In her time of desolation, in her time of loss, of fear, she expressed her faith in God. Think about it. She lost her 16-year-old daughter, and yet she could still sing, He watches over me. And as we enter this week of Thanksgiving, we have much to be thankful for. We have a Heavenly Father who loved us enough to send His Son to die for us so that we may live. He made us alive in Him so that we may live and live eternally. And that is why I believe.